अकाल चैनल नो सब्सक्राइब करो नवी वीडियोस दे नोटिफिकेशन दे लई बेल आइकन नो क्लिक करना ना भूलना वेलकम टू अनदर एडिशन ऑफ द इनसाइट शो माय नेम इज जस्ट वन बोरा योर होस्ट एंड टुडे शो वी विल बी डिस्कसिंग अ वेरी बिग एंड इंपोर्टेंट करंट इशू and the challenges in understanding radicalization and its processes and joining me on the show today is a very interesting guest his name is professor is each emeritus professor Roger Griffin from Oxford Brookes University he is a leading expert on fascism uh, he has outstanding academic achievements uh, especially with a publication on the nature of fascist fascism in, in 1991 Um, which is highly used and regarded all over the world he has received an honorary doctorate from the university of leuven uh, belgium for his contributions to this area of development and he is a professor that has really developed oxford books department and written a number of uh, numerous articles books and publications so we are happy for roger to be joining us today on the show uh, roger thank you very much for coming on to the show and as you you've heard we have a very big issue and this is another area of your developing expertise is on radicalization and an understanding how it works and and other things that sort of work around that um just to to kick off we've had quite a few issues around uh some of the people who become radicalized very much this year in 2019 we had the Christchurch massacre and Uh, that individual who's responsible for uh, going into the mosque and shooting and killing these individuals and and our history also uh, in forms of of other individuals have been radicalized in your view professor what do you think or do you think we have come to grips with understanding these concepts around radicalization de-radicalization and counter-radicalization so well, first of all thank you for inviting me to take part in this uh discussion and interview are these are massive issues um unfortunately there's a there's a big divide between the academic world and the world of counterterrorism and official state understanding of these things i think in the world of academia there's some wonderful publications i'm not necessarily including my own there mm-hmm. but uh there's been a lot of really intelligent work done on what goes on when somebody radicalizes but the problem is translating well a that yeah there there's a a big range of opinions about this so it's very difficult to boil them down to a single theory that's normal in academia there mm-hmm. you'll always find different schools of thought but the other problem is boiling the uh, academic theory down to uh, a simple theory which can then be used in public policy and in the public sector and what you tell school teachers or mothers or whatever and so A there's it's a very complicated issue B there's a lot of different theories and C it's very very difficult to boil it down to a point where you can tell uh, for example parents or teachers what to look out for when somebody is radicalized yeah, as it appears that it would seem a more simpler thing to define the word terror as opposed to even say terrorism um whereas radicalization and all the uh, uh, experts or even practitioners and as you mentioned early academics have suggested or or, or agreed on on one principal thing that radicalization is a process we see it in um the government uh, the document on kind of terrorism and even european um kind of documentations and even internationally a broader field uh, so is it a process have we come to grips with understanding what's involved in it and we see in the media even again last year people are now being arrested under the mental health act and detained uh, on the basis of them becoming radicalized through that particular route or pathway which works in conjunction with someone becoming radicalized so it seems there's not just one single route or avenue or even vulnerability to this whole process yeah well i think you put your finger on the important point i think there is general agreement both in the general public and in uh, and in academia among ac- experts so called experts that we're dealing with a process um that but once you then try to decide what that process is it all gets very complicated now 
Uh, the, broadly speaking, there have been three different approaches to radicalization. One is to approach it through the lens of criminality. Mm -hmm. So you see it as a form of criminal behavior. Now, of course, from a legal point of view, it is, uh, it is a criminal offense to blow something up or kill somebody or mm -hmm. blow up a building. So what it, whatever the motive is, it's a criminal act. And that there has been, and because it, it, it involves law, there, there is quite a lot of expertise and opinion approaching terrorism and radicalization from a, from a criminal point of view. And there's a very important issue there in a liberal society. I mean, uh, Putin, has, in an interview he did yesterday, has said mm -hmm. that we are, we are now passing from the age of liberalism to another age, basically, of authoritarianism, where we don't have to worry about these complicated things like human rights. But I, I'm, I must say that I find that very disturbing. Uh, from the point of view of human rights, there's a very big issue raised by the point, from the point of view of criminality about when opinions and feelings and passions become criminal. I mean, there are various things in the world that I hate. But if I don't act on that hatred and do something criminal about it, then are my thoughts criminal? And then, of course, the world of social media has opened up a huge issue about communicating thoughts mm -hmm. to people who do then act on them. And is it criminal to express thoughts if those thoughts then get translated into action by somebody else? So the criminality of radicalization is a massive, massive issue in itself. And then there's another approach which sees it in terms of madness, of uh, mental problems, of dysfunctionality, of what, however you're going to put it. Somebody whose brain isn't working or personality isn't working in a healthy way. Now, of course, there is some sort of um, grounds to this. There's a, there, there's a court case going through, uh, through the media now about the man who stabbed a fellow passenger on a train that stopped at mm -hmm. Guildford uh, 17 times. And he was a paranoid schizophrenic. And obviously, there are cases where violence is... Uh, prompted by a, a, a madness, a madness that you can you can deal with with therapy or drugs, but uh, but radicalization that leads to violence seems to most people to be something that is actually quite different, and that it would be now generally recognised that you don't get very far by looking at individual cases of terrorism and trying to work out the degree to which the individual had had mental problems. Because, so there's criminalization, there's uh, the, the, the perspective of mental illness. I, come, I represent, if you like, the mm -hmm. third approach, and there probably are other approaches, but the third approach I'd like to make clear to people who are listening to this is, that, is to get inside the head of the, the, the so-called terrorists. And I say, I say so-called because even the language of terrorism and talking about terrorism is very contested. But my approach is to see uh, radicalization as a very human process. And we, we should not, not even begin to start thinking about criminality or madness until we've actually had a close look at the individual case. Mm -hmm. And I approach radicalization from the point of view, if you like, of psychology or social psychology mm -hmm. or even anthropology. And these are the human sciences. So at the heart of the word human sciences is the idea that we treat human beings from the first point onwards as human, which puts certain limits to what we do to them. You don't just start saying that, you know, hang terrorists and everybody who has certain beliefs are terrorists. You, you treat it with as a really complicated human phenomenon. And so that is the point of view that I'd like to talk about with you today. The idea that terrorists are complex human beings who ended up committing acts of violence mm -hmm. for particular reasons which we can uh, we can understand uh, to a large extent by treating these people as as complex human beings yeah absolutely I you alluded to already how some of the legal aspects or frameworks are playing a part in terms of delegating responsibility or informing individuals of our roles. We are aware that the CTSA, the Counter-Terrorism Security Act 2015, was introduced a few years ago and that made it a legal responsibility, in essence putting prevent on a statutory footing. 
um, for professionals to take um, action of those individuals at risk of being drawn into terrorism. But as you already said, uh, one step before that um, is understanding uh, the processes. And, uh, and we also may or may not be aware uh, that, as you were, David Anderson, uh, the former independent reviewer of uh, terrorism laws, uh, re produced a report that was forwarded, uh, at least contents of it, to the Home Select Committee who produced a document in 2016-17 around radicalization, the counter-narrative and the tipping points. And in there, he, he makes reference to radicalization as, as two really contributing areas of grievances and ideals. And, and, and obviously, it's a, it's a lot broader than that. But in terms of your view, Roger, and how you just mentioned, you, you see it in, in another aspect. We, I'm aware that you were quite integral to producing um, sort of research and work around the role of heroic doubling in terrorist radicalization and your book really seems to open up a, a different dimension. What are you actually trying to, to show us when you are, or reveal to us, and it's embedded in other people's work uh, uh, in regards to heroes and how they could play a role and how this is perceived by uh, extremists or even terrorists. Um, so where, do you, where are you in terms of uh, sharing with us the role of heroic doubling in terrorist radicalization? Yeah, well, first of all, of all this, this term, heroic doubling, mm -hmm. uh, will be really not known by many people who are listening. So let's, yeah, so yeah, let's yeah. come to that in a moment. Yeah. Um, what I found when I... Well, I, I should explain the background to this book. I, I've spent a lot of time trying to model what makes people a fascist, OK? I mean, yeah. the, the main case study was what happened to all those Germans who became Nazis in 1929, who mm -hmm. hadn't been Nazis before. And here we're dealing with millions of quite normal human beings. I mean, we're not dealing with millions of psychopaths or millions of criminals. So I was very intrigued about what pressures were exerted on ordinary Germans. And I mean, really, <laughs> conventional, modern, educated, civilized European Germans to turn them into fanatics. And it was very, very clear looking at that issue that we were dealing with uh, not just the collapse of a society economically and socially, but uh, the collapse of the meaning of that society, that people no longer believed in Weimar, no longer believed in the future that was being provided by Weimar. And so they, they, they suffered, well, we can put it in different language, but in my terms, they, they were, they, millions who converted suddenly to Nazism, having not been nationalistic before, um, they were actually suffering from an existential crisis, a crisis of identity, a crisis of not knowing anymore who they were. They, they, they couldn't recognize themselves in the society they were in. This was no longer Germany. And so when you had Hitler promising a new Germany and a new identity, this actually converted about a third of the population to vote for, for him. Now, after 9-11, we had a a rather parallel phenomenon of realizing that there were people in the world who were Muslim, but they had, on the basis of being Muslim, they had created an ideology that legitimized Twin Tower and uh, the Twin Towers attacks, and then later the, the attacks in Paris and all the various attacks that have been committed. And I got very intrigued in how this was being explained by the media and historians and psychologists. And when I started reading around, I realized that actually there was a, a very interesting parallel between ordinary people becoming Nazis and ordinary people becoming... Uh, I mean, when I say ordinary people, I, I'm talking about people who grow up in families and have pets and have holidays and enjoy football, you know, ordinary people uh, who become fanatics. Now, a crucial book I read when I was trying to understand the mentality of Nazis, was a book by a man called Robert Biffen, who was a psychiatrist who studied many phenomena of fanaticism. But the most crucial one for me was when he interviewed at length German doctors who'd served in Dachau and Auschwitz and had carried out experiments on Jews and Russians without any conscience at all, without any sense of guilt. And the term that he used in order to understand how perfectly normal, educated, civilized, modern people who love their wives and their dogs and their children and, and holidays and li listening to jazz or music or whatever could actually go to, 
out and do these terrible things to to uh, human other human beings. He called it doubling. Mm -hmm. He talked about somebody having a normal self and an Auschwitz self, an Auschwitz self, a, another personality that functions differently according to different moral laws because they were convinced by the cause that. Hitler and Nazism had convinced them of. And so when people were trying to understand Islamists in the first place, and later I, I also applied it much more obviously to neo-Nazis and uh, racist white supremacist haters of Muslims, so I'm not just talking about Islam here, it seemed very, very clear that there was a similar process involved. I mean, there, one famous case from the Birmingham area, for example, is of a, of a, of a converted Muslim woman who uh, was bringing up this lovely child who suddenly, as a teenager, disappeared and ended up in the Raqqa and was eventually killed. And he had very clearly, from the testimony of the mother, been a perfectly normal, loving, and still was while he was in Raqqa phoning up and being completely loving and normal towards his mother. But he, he had been caught up in this ideology that legitimized things which most people would find repellent. So it seemed to me that the clue to what was going on in a lot of cases was that somebody was developing a secondary personality. And that secondary personality was not recognizable from a normal point of view because this second, secondary personality was actually performing like we see people be perform in, in epic uh, stories like the Mahabharata or in Greek legend or in war, mm -hmm. war fiction or in video games. These, these were heroes. They were going to die young, but their lives full of meaning and beauty because they had sacrificed themselves and were ready, ready to sacrifice others to their cause. And so I created this phrase, heroic doubling, to try to express the idea that what was going on in the radicalization process was that somebody was going through a, an existential crisis, a crisis of identity and meaning and purpose. Who am I? What am I? Why am I going through this, this reality in this society I don't really relate to? Uh, whether they were Nazis or whether they were Islamists, it didn't really matter. The problem was one of identity and meaning and purpose and action, being able to act on the world. And they developed, either quickly or slowly, this secondary personality that at a certain point took over their lives and enabled them to do things that they would never have done in their ordinary day-to-day -day family life. And so, for me, this approach, which draws on a number of experts, for me it made sense. And I, and I put it in a book and I threw it out there as an idea and it had some resonance. It's certainly not standard. But mm -hmm. some people actually see in it a way of treating so-called terrorists as human beings who have had a, a, an impulse to find something deeply meaningful and, and beautiful in their lives. But this impulse has been channeled into something that legitimizes hatred and violence and, and uh, self, even self-destruction. Thank you. It seems then, Roger, that the whole radicalized the notion of some becoming radicalized, even as you explained with the work that you're currently doing, it, it can cause a sense of fragmentation, especially during the early processes. For example, someone who's got an issue of identity crisis or a problem or grievances, or unable to stabilize the whole psychological or, or, or well-being, etc. So therefore, it, it then now creates a great sense of confusion for a particular individual um, in, in which direction and course to take. It even sounds as though the whole notion of radicalization, which can be applied to people becoming involved in knife crime, in gangs, because radicalization is, is a process as opposed to any one particular, uh, you know, in one particular act or event per se. So then, even the work of uh, which you have alluded to in, in your research, Jessica Stern, uh, a professor who had, I think, in 2012 visited a high security prison in Sweden and interviewed a neo-Nazi inmate, have you referred to, obviously would be like quite the far right for us. Yeah, and he, she explored his mind in quite detail, his psyche. And, and one of the things that he said to her uh, was that he just loved killing people. So mm. are we saying that radicalization has different strands where some just want to um, 
segregate communities. Some people just want to, you know, go into that whole process to cause mayhem. But where, where do we, or how do we work with individuals who say, with responses like that, similar to uh, terrorists today who want to become heroes and martyrs, etc., they just love killing people. Yeah. Well, uh, this is where uh, it's really important to distinguish between what things look like from the outside and what things look like from the inside. I mean, if if a jealous partner kills his or her partner because of a sense of betrayal, obviously. I mean, the, the fact of the murder is the same, but the, the motivation is very different from that of a paranoid schizophrenic or a fanatic, or the recruit to an army where you've been told to fight the enemy. I mean, the killing, the killing in itself, is, it doesn't tell you about the, the reason why or the state of mind. For me, if that man that Jessica Stern interviewed just liked killing people, that is nothing to do with terrorist radicalization, mm -hmm. that is being a, a psycho, mm -hmm. uh, if you like, a, a sociopath. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite interesting the way Killing Eve has become a major uh, TV program for millions of viewers, and they basically they're taking vicarious pleasure in watching a story about a, sci a, a, a sociopath, a, a, actually a psychopath, who um, lures a woman into being a sort of uh, psychopath. We are, we are living in a society fascinated by psychopaths, but I think this confuses the, the, the issue because if that one man in prison just liked killing people and called himself a Nazi as a sort of label, then that for me is not relevant to what I'm saying about heroic doubling. Mm -hmm. But for example, let's take another case. If we take the case of Tom Mayer, the man who killed Joe Cox, um, mm -hmm. Several, several years ago now. I mean, he, lead, he led a quiet life. He was a complex guy. He had uh, some, some mental issues. He actually created a peace garden in a local um, drop-in center for people with, with, met, met, with, with issues about their, their sanity. Uh, so that was one side of him, very, sort of, if you like, gentle, a gentle gardener. But the other side of him, his, his heroic double, was getting a weekly fix of input from neo-Nazi magazines and books. And on the quiet, he had created a sort of, if you like, a Jekyll and Hyde. There was this really quite a very private, rather sad, uh, peaceful person. But there was also this guy who was absolutely tanked up with ideologically fueled hatred of uh, various types of people. I mean, obviously... Uh, migrants and Muslims and blacks and a whole load of categories of human being, but the, his en his anger focused on this woman, a local MP who wanted Britain to stay in Europe, and he saw her as a sort of enemy of Britishness, and therefore his stabbing and shooting of this woman in the street was a far more complex complex crime than just one liking killing people. He only, I say only, but he killed one person. But he was definitely an, a product of radicalization because he'd gone through an emotional and psychological and actually, in this case, ideological process that turned him into a Nazi killer. So I think it's very important for people who are following this discussion to distinguish between people who just wear the badge of being a Nazi or an Islamist just because they basically are drawn towards violence. Yeah? But, and those who arrive at a state of fanatical hatred and violence through a long inner process, which is actually quite complicated and, for me, quite tragic, because what they're looking for is something quite beautiful. They're looking for a goal, an ideal, a way of sacrificing themselves to something higher. And it seems to somehow get mischanneled into a worldview which demonizes entire categories of other human beings and legitimizes hating and killing them. And this then, uh, Roger, argues um, strongly the notion, um, and I think you mentioned it already, that, and, and even in some of your writings and work, that there is a deep sense of fixation involved. And also you refer to um, a concept of splitting of an individual's psyche where two kind of different people are evolved from that. So is someone or who 
a, is um, becoming radicalized, fixated on a particular event or behavior or action which they follow through, whether it's murder, whether it's um, you know violence or whatever it may be, is there an almost guaranteed sense of fixation when somebody is or has yeah. or, or becoming radicalized? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the key words that gets thrown around without people thinking about what it means a lot is the word fanatical. Now, fanatical comes from the Latin fanum or mm -hmm. fanum, meaning a temple, a sacred, a, t a sacred space. And the fanatic is somebody who has found his sacred space, and that's inside them. And what we have always seen in human behavior is the readiness of human beings to, to kill and be killed for something considered sacred, because the sacred is the ultimate meaning, the ultimate truth, the ultimate reality. And anything that threatens that can engender passions inside a human being that make it seem worth killing and dying for. And so that fanaticism in, implies fixity and it implies obsession, uh, which if you look at the religious wars in Europe, if you look at the way Protestants and Catholics killed each other or the way Christians killed Muslims in the Crusades or all the religious wars in history and even the great cultural clashes between, say, Nazis and, and Russians and, and Russian Bolsheviks. They're all based on reducing the world down to a single perfect truth, which I find really scary because in my world, there is no perfect truth. There is no purity. There are many truths. And if we can't live with the plurality of humanity and the plurality of reality, without wanting total truth. And if we can't live without accepting the absolute, uh, lack of an absolute, there is no absolute. We are mixed up, confused human beings with bits of truth and bits of falsehood. If we can't accept the messiness of life and we move towards being attracted by an absolute truth and a fixed truth, then I'm afraid we are on the slippery slope towards some sort of radicalization. Now, there are healthy radicalizations, mm -hmm. people who want to go and stop Ebola or work in work for refugees or, or care for their parents above all else, to, yeah. even when they, they're suffering and they have Alzheimer's or whatever, and they will make that the fixed point of their lives. Being fixed and fanatical is not in itself a terrible thing, but I'm afraid the modern world is deluged with examples of negative obsession, negative fanaticism and lethal forms of simplifying the world down to one or two fixed truths. And I'm afraid uh, uh, it, it, there is a war going on between fixity and obsession and fanaticism on the one hand and defense of plurality, defense of humanity, defense of the richness of humanity on the other. And I hope that uh, the network that you're interviewing me from and all the academics and all the priests and religious experts in the world can work for a complex, beautiful, rich world, which is not defined by any one single truth. Because single truths lead to hatred and they are very scary. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Griffin, for uh, being with us today on the show. Your input has been valuable for uh, listeners and readers and obviously we look forward to this other work that you're producing and uh, what else is in the pipeline. But thank you very much, uh, Roger, for joining us on the Insight Show. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And thank I apologise for all the long words. Excellent. <laughs> it's all appreciated. But And thank you to uh, viewers today for tuning into the Insight Show, a show that, as I said, we uh, explore the issues that affect us locally, nationally and internationally. I'm your host, Jaswan Boro, and we'll see you again next time on the Insight Show. Akal channel subscribe karo. Navi videos